Okay. Good evening. I'm Richard Haas, and I want to personally welcome everybody here to the Council on Foreign Relations tonight. Tonight we are here to celebrate, uh, to recognize, and ultimately to buy and read. <laughs> and the, uh, especially buy. Especially buy, yes. Cho forced to choose between buying and reading, we know where the authors come out. Uh, the, the title of the book, By All Means Necessary. The subtitle of the book, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. The authors of the book, Liz Economy, who is the CV Star Senior Fellow and Director uh, for Asia Studies here at the Council on Foreign Relations. And her co-author is Michael Levy. And Michael's the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment. Uh, and, it, and directs the program at the Council on Energy Security and, and Climate Change. And they are the uh, co-authors of this new, important, and readable book. <laughs> so let's begin, uh, as they sang in uh, that movie, uh, at the very beginning. Uh, why this title? Why, uh, what is by all means necessary refer to, Liz? Uh, okay. Before I get into that, let me just have my Oscar moment and thank you, Richard, uh, for uh, providing. Do you want to say how everybody <laughs> loves you? <laughs> okay, You're going to have your Shirley MacLaine moment, too. Um, well, I was Sally Field, but oh, anyway. Sally Field, whatever. Yeah. Um, okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, no, but thank you, Richard, uh, first off, uh, for providing such a terrific environment uh, in which Mike and I could write the book uh, and such patience uh, as well uh, to, for us to give birth to this book. Uh, and also, I think we want to thank uh, our scores of research associates yes. and interns uh, who provided us with you know, enormous assistance, um, and in particular, our two current research associates, uh, Will Picos and uh, Alex muller Hogg. Uh, and I think I want to thank uh, our fifth floor friends as well, uh, because they really you know, sustain us uh, through all of this. Um, Just to be clear, fifth floor is their colleagues, not the mice. Yes. <laughs> Um, okay, so those are my things. You may have your own, your own <laughs> things to make as well. Um, why don't I take the, I'll take the title then, and maybe you want to take the subtitle, uh, because they really reflect two different parts of the book and I think two different things that we're trying to get at. Um, the title really um, is a reflection of all of the tools uh, that China has at its disposal uh, to secure resources from outside its uh, boundaries. Uh, so this can be everything from you know, Xi Jinping's personal diplomacy uh, to sort of vast trade aid and investment deals that uh, we see China uh, attempting to strike uh, when it goes to resource-rich uh, countries, uh, to the low-cost financing and labor uh, that Chinese firms can bring to the table, oftentimes <coughs> seeming to undercut uh, the Western multinationals, uh, to other kinds of things like corruption and backdoor deals uh, that can get struck uh, between some uh, leaders of resource-rich countries and their Chinese counterparts. Uh, it can also mean things like uh, a willingness uh, to put down stakes, uh, money-losing stakes, for long periods of time uh, with the hope uh, that a deal will pay off uh, down the line. Uh, so the Chinese have a long time horizon in many instances. Can I instances. The, the yeah, risk okay. of getting into the substance? When you say so the Chinese are willing to put down stakes and even take a loss for quite some time in the, in the hope, and I think your words were, the deal will pay off. What does pay off mean? What is, how do the Chinese measure the value? Or you t is, it, is it by economic? Is it strategic? Is it, is it something else? What, what, what's, their, what, what's their yardstick? That's an excellent question. Um, actually, it depends on who you're talking about. Uh, you know, for the Chinese government, it can mean you know, the strategic sort of element. So for example, some of you may have just seen, I think it was in the uh, Financial Times, uh, there was an article talking about the National Development Reform Commission uh, telling uh, Chinese steel producers that they should continue to go out uh, and take stakes uh, in iron ore production. Right? But Chinese steel producers have no interest in that. They have overcapacity. They don't want to do that. But the NDRC came out and said, well, listen, this is important for strategic reasons and because we want to have a say in global trade. It's important for our voice in the global trading arena. So that's an example of where there's a difference between the interests of the companies to make money and the interest of the government to kind of have a big political voice. And I assume when there's a slight difference of interest, uh, it's not always the company that wins. 
No, but it's surprisingly, sometimes the companies have Not some passive, aggressive ways of dealing with it. Michael, uh, before we get much further, talk about the subtitle, which is uh, How Challenger's Resource Quest is Changing the World. Is it changing the world, and if so, how and how much? So first, I want to echo Liz's thanks to everyone. I won't repeat uh, all of them, but, but thank you all to everyone. That, you can uh, thank me if you'd like. <laughs> particularly Richard for creating <laughs> such a fantastic environment. So we picked the subtitle mostly for search engine optimization. Oh my um, god, I didn't even know what that meant. This is what I get for having Mike as my co-author. <laughs> uh, but, but secondarily, we couldn't ha call it why China's China's resource. Quest was changing the world. Um, we're focused on identifying the different places where China is changing the world, but also the places where it isn't. Uh, so this is not a book about how China's resource quest is changing everything in the world, but about seeing what's real and really what's myth uh, out there. And I'm not going to list all of the different ways in which it's changing the world, but maybe I'll highlight two or three. Uh, there's enormous focus on Chinese investment in countries. But where the biggest economic consequences have come so far is actually from Chinese trade. Uh, Chinese demand for minerals, for energy, for food have helped drive up prices with huge consequences for economies around the world, regardless of whether China is an investor in those. So if you want a headline, top way that China's resource quest is changing the world, resources are more expensive, people want more of them, and the economic consequences for producers and for consumers are huge. Uh, another uh, really interesting place where China is changing the world is in its efforts to make sure that there are secure routes for those resources to get back to China. And we tend to take this integrated nature of the global economy for granted, that uh, something produced in one part of the world can be moved to another very quickly. I don't know that the Chinese do particularly when they look at their backyard, at the sea lanes near them, congested, contested by a lot of different countries uh, for a variety of different reasons, not just because of resource trade. But increasingly, I think you see uh, China paying attention and asserting its interest in that region, and we'll see increasing security consequences from that. There's a, an urban, I don't know if it's legend or myth or assumption surrounding this subject. And the only reason I know it, because I'm an expert on neither China nor Africa, uh, is every time, well not every time, but many times when I speak publicly about foreign policy and international relations, I get asked the question along the following lines, which says, shouldn't we be worried about what China is doing in Africa? Aren't they cornering the market for some purpose, be it financial, strategic, or both, and aren't we going to wake up one day and regret it? What is your sense? Of, is, is, is this, if you will, an urban or non-urban myth? Or is there actually something to this? Should we be worried about China's quest? Um, I'll start. Maybe you might want to uh, pick up. Uh, I think to, to Mike's first point, one of the interesting things that we found was that China really, uh, its resource quest is primarily rooted in trade rather than investment. And actually, when you look at Chinese investment in Africa compared to others, it actually ranks fourth in the world. It's not the largest uh, investor uh, in Africa, which you know everybody assumes. Uh, when you look at sort of China's uh, search for land, you know, it's third, right, after Canada and the United States, and quite a distant third. Uh, so it's important to keep everything, you know, relative um, and keep it in, in proportion to what actually, is, uh, what actually is going on. I think in terms of Africa, uh, certainly it is exerting a profound impact, uh, you know, in governance issues. Uh, and so whether you're looking at uh, labor issues or environmental issues, uh, you really just have to look back at what China does on the home front to understand the impact that it's having in Africa, as well as other places. But, but should, should we should, be concerned? Should we be competing with them more? Should we basically be talking to African governments or others to block China to some extent? Is this something that we will strategically come to root? I think it depends on the resource. I think we have to look at the structure of different resource markets. And that's one of the reasons we went so broad uh, in the book. If you look at oil, for example, African oil is still a limited part of the global market. Uh, the Chinese right now sell most of the oil they produce in Africa onto the open market. Could they, in a crisis, direct that back to China? Sure, but there would be plenty of other resource from elsewhere to make up for uh, the suppliers that tend to buy that. Now, you can get into other markets where there's a lot more concentration, and you want to make sure there's diversity. 
So if China were to go and start to buy up a lot of rare earth deposits in Africa, a place where they have a lot of concentration and where there's been a trend toward diversification that we want to intensify, uh, then that would be a place where we have a strong strategic interest and we would want to uh, divert that. And there's another place uh, where it's important, and this is rooted in economics but gets into to politics. The Chinese companies can sometimes make it uh, easy for African governments, Latin American governments, other governments to set up uh, regimes for investment that are not particularly strong. Uh, so they're ones that are appealing to Chinese companies but that don't bring all the other capital and technology and capabilities in. In the long run that means that we have less resources in the world, higher prices for consumers, less security for all of us. So we should be careful to make sure that uh, countries uh, don't get suckered into doing the easy thing that hurts us in the long run. Liz, uh, I often hear stories that the Chinese, when they invest in Africa, often bring a lot of their own workforce with them. And that just like 30, 40 years ago, there used to be the phrase, the ugly American, for some of what we were doing in Asia, or in other parts of what used to be the third world. I actually hear stories that now the idea of the ugly Chinese, and that in Africa there's lots of resentment. How true? Um, true. Uh, although primarily in the infrastructure rather than in you know, areas like mining and oil and gas, but still you do find it. And I think you find it in a couple of different ways. So it can be, uh, and frankly, what we're talking about in terms of Africa applies as well to uh, you know, Southeast Asia and sometimes to Latin America. So this is not, you know, Africa has received sort of the bulk of the media attention, but really what, what Mike and I did was look across the entire landscape and find that all these practices are replicated from one region to the next. But to your point, um, yes, ugly Chinese. There's enormous uh, sort of uh, resentment, uh, both in terms of when you have Chinese managers of mines uh, who uh, believe in some ways, as some foreign ministry <laughs> officials would say to me, that uh, you know, the Africans uh, don't work hard. That's why we need to bring our labor in. They like to sing and dance. Uh, they want to go to church uh, and uh, have labor unions and all sorts of inconvenient things uh, and not work on the weekends. Um, and so we need to bring in our own labor, right? They, they're willing to work longer hours at, and for, for cheaper rates. Uh, there's also a problem uh, when it comes to the individual Chinese going across. So not just companies bringing in their management and then exporting their labor, but you also had, for example, in the case of Ghana, uh, you know, several villages in Guangdong province uh, simply <laughs> up and move to Ghana uh, and begin uh, gold mining and cause a lot of environmental problems. You know, this is not something that's state-directed uh, and, in fact, cause enormous problems for the foreign ministry and for the Chinese government. And in the end, uh, the uh, Ghanaian government you know, kicked them out last summer, kicked out 4,500 uh, Chinese miners. And in retaliation, apparently, the Chinese have slowed the visa process and are making it difficult for the uh, Ghanaian government to access you know, a $3 billion loan. So there is a huge challenge. Um, Issues of communication, issues of low pay, issues of you know, labor safety. Uh, these are all the things that uh, you know, mining workers who work for Chinese mines talk about, whether you're talking about Africa or Papua New Guinea or elsewhere. Given some of that, if one were looking at this as a historical trajectory, is it your sense that, uh, if you will, the China moment in Africa has peaked? Well, I don't know whether it's, it's peaked. I, I think one of the things that Mike and I try to do in the book um, is not just look at this very moment, but try to look a little bit at what the Chinese are doing to improve their situation. And so when you're looking at issues uh, sort of that are tied into um, uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, you do find now uh, that you have change being brought, you know, in part by what's taking place at home. Right? So when you've got uh, the Chinese themselves demanding uh, better environmental standards from their companies, you know, that will then become what the Chinese companies export, or better labor standards. Um, you also have pressure from the outside. Uh, states with stronger capacity <coughs> demand that the Chinese uh, do a better job. Uh, and you have learning. I think uh, in some cases, uh, for example, in Peru, we found you know, early entrants in the mining sector you know, had very poor practices across the board. Uh, much later entrants, however, uh, began to take advantage of you know, an infrastructure that had developed so that uh, they hired you know, Western consultants, might even bring a, a, a local uh, you know, mining head. Uh, and so you have a much better uh, evaluation of Chinese practices now, you know, pretty much 10 to 15 years down the line. So Richard, to your, to your question, I don't think it's peak, but I think the honeymoon is over. 
And people have had experience, and they don't like a lot of that experience. Uh, and I think that's intensified, and Liz pointed to that when she talked about Ghana. It's intensified as smaller players have been able to get out there, and they're tougher to control. I, when I was working on the book, I went to Zambia. Zambia has this notorious mine, a column mine. It's a private Chinese mine. Uh, every few months, someone seems to get shot at, uh, at it, whether it's a worker or a Chinese manager. And I went and visited with the Chinese ambassador in Lusaka. And I brought, up, uh, I brought up the mine. I was a bit nervous doing it. It's a very hot button issue. And he said, if you want to buy this mine, I will do everything I can do to have them sell it to you. <laughs> Gives you some sense of how uneven the Chinese government's control is over what's happening out there. I want to come back to that question. I just got a couple more. Then we'll open it up to our members and our guests here tonight, which is you know the old saw, whatever you want to call it, about trade following flag or flag following the trade. What's the balance here? What, what's, what's, what's the engine, what's the caboose of this, of this interaction with, uh, with the world? That's a, I'm not quite sure. You mean the, so the I, so you may, I'm not sure. Is it the companies <laughs> driving it, or is it the policy driving it? And this is, a, this is an endless question. Uh, one thing that came up over and over as we were researching the book is that the Chinese government is less capable of directing companies to do specific things than a lot of people believe. They can try to put together packages, but the companies don't necessarily play ball. The CEOs of the biggest companies have equal rank to the ministers that are supposed to govern them. Uh, so it makes it tough for one to win out over the other. But what the government does do is create an environment in which it's attractive to a lot of these companies to go out and do investments in particular ways. They set up access to cheap capital. They uh, have a promotion system. And these, are, these leaders are senior party members. They are not just looking to make a lot of money, though that's part of it. They're looking to get promoted. And promotion means a political job. Uh, a senior political job, and so they're going to have the state's objectives in the back of their mind. But it's a more nuanced uh, interaction. It's really sort of setting the environment and the direction uh, rather than uh, dictating the terms most of the time. Right. Let, me just, let, me just, let me just add one thing, I think, um, it, to, to just flesh out what Mike was saying, which is, you know, if you look, the National Development Reform Commission will list sort of the key resources uh, that they want companies to go out and get. And they will, the Chinese government will go out with you know, various ministers, with the heads of state owned enterprises uh, to these countries. And as Mike said, you know, structure these big deals. Uh, and the NDRC will lay out an entire plan for a country. But companies don't necessarily want to participate in those deals. So sometimes that's what, when you read, for example, that you know, there's $70 billion promised uh, in uh, resource and infrastructure deals uh, for Brazil dating back you know, since 2007, and only 30% of that has been realized, you begin to understand uh, that difference between what the government is setting out and what the firms are actually doing. And your, your subtitle is How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. How is China's Resource Quest changing China? What's the, what's the blowback, if you will, from this experience? I think it's, frankly, I think it's just beginning. Um, I think there are now um, a couple of different ways in which the Chinese public uh, has become quite concerned. Uh, for example, the safety of Chinese citizens. Uh, that's something that you know, the government typically has not paid much attention to. Uh, and in fact, when uh, about 27, I guess, uh, workers from Sino-Hydro were kidnapped in Sudan back in 2012, I want to say, um, the Chinese government, uh, the response from the embassy in Sudan was, well, you're just going to have to expect this. Uh, because as you know, we go out, more of our workers are going to go out, and this kind of thing is just going to happen. You know, and the internet erupted. Uh, like, this is not acceptable <laughs> uh, for the Chinese government to be saying. And you know, things like, you know, if the US, uh, if this happened to the United States, you know, they would send in the Marines and all this kind of thing. So you know, what is our government doing? Um, and so I think there's a, a a big uh, sort of upsurge from the general public uh, concerning this issue of, of personal safety. And now you have Sino-Hydro, for example, developing a list of countries where they don't want to do business necessarily, places that they consider dangerous. And this is something quite new, because that really does fly in the face of, we don't mix business with politics. We don't care what's going on in the internal situation of a country. We're just going there to do business. But you have the Chinese people and the Chinese companies beginning to say, well, actually, in those situations, we don't want to do business. I think the other way in which you're starting to see things change is um, 
people are realizing, you know, when you have a change of government like you have in uh, Burma, Myanmar, right, and all of a sudden the Chinese, you know, go from being ostensibly this, you know, trusted, most important uh, partner uh, to the sort of scourge <laughs> uh, of, of the region, um, they're looking and saying, you know, obviously we did something wrong. And so now you have Chinese NGOs, you know, traveling to Burma, Myanmar and, and doing investigations and saying to the Chinese companies, you've clearly mishandled this. You know, you've, you know, all you've done is operate at the top level. You haven't engaged with the, the people. You need to develop better practices. So these are the kinds of changes that we see taking place, nascent, I would say. But these, this kind of blowback is beginning to affect. Maybe add, add one small one onto that. A big consequence of China's resource quest is that the cost of all these resources have gone way up. And one of the main reactions in China is to try and improve efficiency in order to not have its economy be so exposed to this extraordinary cost that uh, it itself has helped create. And I think it's a huge piece of China's response. It's also a big piece uh, that will determine the future consequences of China's resource quest. If they succeed in insulating themselves from it a bit, they'll also help reduce the pressure on the rest of us. And if they fail to cut their consumption or curb their consumption for their own self-interest, we'll all suffer as a result. Uh, last question for me, then I'll open it up. Uh, do you get the sense with the new leadership in China, there is any reconsideration of this policy, given some of the things you've just alluded to? Are there people now really saying, are we sure we want to be doing this as much as we've been doing it, much in the same way as we've been doing it? Is any of this being, if you will, revisited in a serious fashion? Um, I think with... I haven't seen anything with just this new leadership. I think that there's um, been an effort, you know, within the Ministry of Commerce, within some of the bureaucracies, uh, to start over the past few years, uh, beginning to develop uh, better policies uh, for companies. You know, saying you must undertake an environmental impact assessment, or you're not going to get a loan. I think that kind of thing has been taking place, or you know, stock exchanges uh, trying to say, um, you know, you must report to us if you've been, you know, blacklisted by an environmental protection agency. I think at that level you do see some things. I think the foreign ministry is extremely concerned. Um, I met with the number two of both the, the Africa and the Latin America departments, and um, you know, they both said they're spending an enormous amount of time uh, be setting up like mini consulates out in some of these mining areas uh, to deal with all of the, the problems uh, that these you know, resource investments are causing for the Chinese image. Uh, so I think that there's consideration at that level, but I haven't really seen a serious rethink uh, yet, you know, emanating from the top about the overall approach uh, to doing uh, investment. So one place where there's some learning, I think is, at least in some parts of the Chinese government, there's increasing appreciation that owning the resources overseas doesn't necessarily give you a lot of additional security. And there was a very strong belief uh, in that direction 10, 15 years ago. Uh, there's more trust of the market, though it's not complete yet. That said, because they've institutionalized a lot of the incentives that uh, grew out of that fear of the market and that desire to control resources, the shift in opinions doesn't necessarily translate into a shift in how the government operates. And the other place where they've probably leaned in more, uh, or are increasingly leaning in more, is in the military side. I mean, this new leadership, uh, I mean, Liz can talk about this more than I can, but has really focused on the military. And that's inevitably going to lead to more discussion about China providing its own security for the sea lanes over which its resources travel. Well, we're not seeing that yet in the uh, Middle East or Persian no. Gulf, but uh, I'm curious Closer to, to see home. it. One last question, I'm sorry. I was, sorry. <laughs> which is, uh, did you ever come across anyone in the Chinese government who had studied the American or Japanese experience and said, we're gonna learn from this and do it differently? No. Okay. Just curious. No. <laughs> okay, a perfect place to open up. No more trick questions. <laughs> sure. Uh, people, uh, people would just introduce themselves, wait for microphone, we'll get as many thank questions you. Uh, thank as you. we can. Mahesh Kotacha, thank you very much. Uh, Elizabeth and uh, uh, your co-author, thank you for the uh, great uh, introduction to the book. My question, Elizabeth, is to you uh, on the issue of uh, the institutional arrangements with respect to infrastructure with the Chinese embed or try to embed in the countries in which they invest into infrastructure. Uh, it is said that there is not as much of a stress on the rule of law and on institutional arrangements for markets to work to allow prices to work for the infrastructure created if it's, if it's public-private type, public type partnerships. Could you comment on 
Is that what you meant? And, and are they then doing what, uh, what uh, Richard asked about, learning from US experience or Western experience on, on insisting on rule of law, proper contracts and the like in order to invest? Uh, is there, I hear of some kind of efforts on the part of the Development Bank of China, uh, China Development Bank and others to try to learn from this experience and co-invest in fact. Um, in terms of the infrastructure, I haven't seen um, much uh, learning taking place. I'm trying to think of any cases. Um, Mike, I think, probably has looked at the oil and gas sector and seen a fair amount of co-investing. Um, but in terms of, I haven't seen, I have to say, um, I haven't seen the rule of law uh, become a particularly important element in, in the um, in the infrastructure sector when China's gone abroad to, to these particular countries. Right. Um, I haven't seen them pushing that, that issue. I, I think we found more to be the case that you know, states with stronger capacity would push the Chinese to do a better job. I don't know. And in oil and gas, the Chinese often co-invest out of necessity. They don't have the technological capability or the managerial capability to develop a lot of the big resources that are out there. But I don't think you see an inclination where they don't have to work with others to go out of their way to do it. No one on this side. Sure. Hi, uh, Greg Lindsay with the World Policy Institute. Um, I was just curious if you came across in your reporting um, sort of instances of interesting sort of economic blowback in terms of how China is transforming economies uh, in the sense of where they're locating headquarters, locating units, and also um, how they're using Africa as a bridgehead to export into it. So for example, I think one of the things that's underreported about Dubai is that something like 2,000 Chinese companies have set up headquarters there. There's 150,000 Chinese in Dubai because they use it as their North African headquarters and because they're exporting so much into Africa. Um, considering there's a whole narrative around the US that we're going to export our way into emerging markets as a way to you know, bring back the American economy, have the Chinese beaten us to it in Africa because of that? Um, I, I think one of the complaints uh, within Africa uh, is, in fact, that the Chinese are extracting the resources and then exporting you know, finished products. And one of the things that the Chinese have tried to do, not only in Africa, but, but largely in Africa, is to develop these you know, export zones, uh, some, somewhat modeled on sort of the Chinese, uh, its own uh, economic uh, development history and trajectory. Um, they have not, although there's a debate over how uh, effective or successful they've been, I would say the weight of evidence is that they are not particularly successful. Uh, and you know, that the idea is to set up manufacturing zones, uh, basically, in, in these countries uh, in order to encourage uh, sort of the kind of skills and training and, and development that the African countries and others are asking of the Chinese, uh, so that they're not just those neo-colonialists. Um, and uh, so far, I would say we have not heard a lot of positive reporting about the um, about what's been developed. I think maybe there's one case, uh, you know, Mauritius maybe, um, but by and large, you find things like, first of all, companies don't want to participate in them, uh, or for example, uh, the you know, 17 Chinese companies will, will be there, but they're all sort of subsidiaries of the Chinese construction companies, and they're just really feeding into that process, and nothing really is is developing that's going to assist in the development of you know the local population. So I think that is the Chinese effort, but I don't think it's it's really developed in a in a way that's made much of a difference. And your point about inward exports into these countries is interesting. Uh, a lot of these places, when you go to them and you try to get people to talk to you about what they like and don't like about Chinese activities and resources. All they want to talk to you about is the cheap Chinese goods of the market that are putting their, uh, their people out of work. And so it's really important when you look country by country and try to understand the impact of this resource quest that you make sure that the things that you're seeing happening are actually a result of that effort to secure resources. A lot of the time they're about these other things, uh, like you point out, that are tenuously connected to what's happening in resources, but really a different phenomenon. Bob Hormitz. You need a microphone, sir. Thanks very much. Uh, I have a question. I just wanted to make one uh, comment on from whom the Chinese have learned. The one thing, if they've learned anything from anyone about this, is the European experience, which is don't become too dependent on any one supplier. I think that's really one of the interesting things. They saw how the Europeans became very heavily dependent on particularly Gazprom 
and they have made a major effort to diversify their sourcing, which is rather interesting. The, the, the point I'm particularly interested in asking you to pursue a little bit further, there are a lot of negatives, the Chinese and their sort of gold rush to get mines and steel and all these other things. But you could make, an, and we've had a lot of issues with them as a result of it. The one point you could make, though, on the other side is, to the extent their production is additive, that they go into countries that no one else would go into, either because their social policies are so abhorrent, their politics are so awful, Sudan uh, and others, or they simply are willing to take these risks that Liz talked about, which is plunk money down and then hope they can get results down the road. How do you weigh that? Because that really is an interesting positive, negative, yin-yang for the, for the markets. And I'm the yes. negative, and Mike's the positive, so I'm going to let Mike <laughs> so talk about this. It's <laughs> obviously a debate, and there's no yeah. yes. answer, but, but it's an interesting <laughs> debate. So I'd be interested right. Yeah. So let me make a, a very quick observation on your Gazprom lesson learned point, which is really important. The Chinese have discovered an alternative to imported natural gas. Uh, unfortunately, it's coal. It's uh, domestic coal, and it has big pro creates big problems uh, for them domestically and for us internationally. But that's one of those places where uh, I'm skeptical that you'll see enormous Chinese demand for imported natural gas develop unless they can find ways to continually diversify. If they can't, they'll just choose to use a different fuel source or, on, or, or develop their own if they can. Um, so on, the, on this question of, of additive versus something else, yeah, I think particularly when the Chinese are willing to take risks that others aren't, when they are very patient, they don't need to report to their investors for the next quarter, uh, they, can have, uh, they can add to the global supply of oil in particular, so a market that's genuinely global, uh, benefiting consumers everywhere. I think you have to be a bit careful, though. Uh, again, you can have a bit of a sugar high from some of these things uh, with dangerous long-term consequences. If China is investing in places and creating the image of a lot of supply, that can deter investment in supply elsewhere. And so if the Chinese supply ultimately doesn't materialize, or if it's volatile because of bad security situations, uh, then that you can end up worse off than you started. So it's a complicated uh, mix, but certainly that force is there and you have to think about it when you're uh, doing a net assessment of what's happening. Sure. Uh, Richard Greco from Phil and Jerry Capital Partners. Uh, one resource that we can't live without is water. And my understanding is that China has a real shortage and a problem with clean water for environmental reasons, just because of a lack of uh, of water sources to begin with. <laughs> What's China doing to secure its clean water sources? Is it succeeding? And if not, what are the consequences? Someone should write a book about that subject. I know, I know the river runs black. OK, <laughs> so um, yes, the water issue. I mean, China is primarily China is doing things on the home front, right? So um, you know, whether it's pushing forward on you know, desalinization or experimenting with water pricing, I mean, they have a lot of the sort of traditional tools uh, at their disposal that you know, other countries use as well that are, are, are water short. Um, conservation, you know, pushing forward with a lot of different kinds of experiments. In terms of our book, uh, we looked at uh, China's control uh, of the headwaters of some of you know, Asia's most important rivers. And in two cases in particular, uh, we look at the Mekong, we look at the Ili, which goes up uh, into Kazakhstan, and we looked um, at uh, the uh, Yalantang Po, which uh, goes, becomes in the Brahmaputra. And um, the Mekong is a different issue because it's, it's an energy-related uh, one, primarily uh, hydropower plants. But in both the case of the India and, and the uh, Kazakhstan, there is talk of river diversion right, to, to help China. And that is actually something that China does a lot of internally, its own river diversions, enormous river diversions. Um, and so what we found, uh, and this was a case where I think uh, the hype uh, surrounding it turned out to be greater than the reality. Um, you know, in the case of Kazakhstan, um, the, the Kazakhs have pushed the Chinese. They're, they're worried. The, the Chinese um, have talked about diverting the, the, you know, in several places, uh, diverting uh, water. And uh, the Kazakhs are worried, and they've gotten the Chinese to the point of talking about you know, water quality and, and sort of preliminarily talking about resource allocation, uh, but no formal agreement. The Chinese are extremely reluctant uh, to acknowledge 
uh, that there are shared water rights in that respect. They, in, in no case uh, do they recognize that, uh, and they haven't signed on to the UN agreement that recognizes that. Uh, they're one of only three countries in the world, in fact. Um, in, so they, the Kazakhs have made more progress in many respects than anybody else that we looked at. In the Indian case, um, certainly there's going to be damming, um, more damming um, of the Yarlun Sampo, but it does not look uh, as though there's going to be the river diversion aspect of it that has received enormous amount of attention in India. And for some of, some of you may have read Brahma Chalani's book uh, on this topic, and he's quite concerned. He's probably the most uh, you know, vociferous and agitated person, uh, you know, expert scholar out there. Um, but for reasons of actual technic technical feasibility, uh, it doesn't seem possible. The Chinese have denied that they have any such plans on the books. That, to me, is not sufficient proof, uh, because lots of times the Chinese deny things and then quietly start doing them. Um, but in this case, it seems that technically it's not even feasible. Michael Pillsbury. Thank you. I wanted to present you with a puzzle that I cannot no. solve. Um, but it picks up on both something Michael said about not trusting the market, that they trust the market more now, but it was a pretty low level of trust 20 years ago, and something Elizabeth started out with about orders from on high, the National Development Commission and others. In, we just had about number 216 military delegation come in the Pentagon. And I have not been there for all 216, but I've been there for most of them. They often bring up resources and they're being slandered for raping Africa, this kind of thing, and they think we do that, which we don't. But the puzzle is, when I've asked them for books, theories, who back in Beijing is advising your leaders about the quest for resources and all means necessary? Uh, where is this coming from? And I thought there'd be no books. Instead, they gave me 20 books over time. They've got a formula this comprehensive national power formula, which everything's weighted. Military force is only 10%. Resources is much more. They've got complicated lists of rich resources to get. Mm -hmm. As you say, it's sort of like assignments to the companies so that economists know this is stupid. It's inefficient, you waste money. But if does it make sense to you? This is the puzzle. Does it make sense to you that their system is still top-down driven enough that the Petroleum University and these people who do the CNP scoring are somehow influencing decision makers at the Politburo level that's driving what Richard asked you, the title of your book. Go out and do this. And when the economists object, Chinese economists, this is stupid, it's costing us 30% or 40% more than it should. The decision makers are so certain that we live in a resource, almost paranoid, resource, uh, conflict world, almost a paranoid view, that these orders must be obeyed. And that's what your book essentially is showing, is the behavior that follows from these top-down formulas that are actually in, the, in their reading materials. Sorry for the long question, but I wanted to get the puzzle out to you that I claim I can't solve. Do you want to start and then I'll go? Sure. So, if you're a high-level policymaker, you're usually not optimizing, you're trying to manage risk. And so even if you start to believe in the market, if you're not totally there, uh, it might make sense for you to follow some of this and to still try and encourage your companies to, uh, to invest and to secure resources in these different ways. I think it's only when you start to see some of the strong countervailing risks on the other side, the downsides to doing these things wrong, that you really revisit some of that. And so you don't need to only look to China to see this, this sort of sense of risk aversion among policymakers when it comes to this. And there are plenty of economists in the United States who will tell policymakers that it doesn't matter uh, whether it's a U.S. company producing oil abroad or a uh, foreign company. I mean, it matters for uh, commercial success, and it's important for American businesses to succeed, but it doesn't matter for the security of our oil supply. But uh, over and over, uh, our State Department can be persuaded uh, different, to different degrees at different times in our history, but can be persuaded to go out and help make sure American companies succeed in investing in oil, in part through an energy security argument. Uh, so this is a powerful argument, and it turns out that 
uh, even hundreds of economists often are unsuccessful in persuading policymakers to change their tack. So let me, can I just make one Quickly. small addition? Yeah, one or okay. two questions. Then. So, okay. So I think one thing that you certainly uh, appreciate, Mike, is that uh, this has a long history within China itself, right? And so the idea that um, you know, the state will direct the resource quest and will determine even within China what resources should be developed or not developed is, you know, dates back to the Ming, right? When, you know, they would say, we're not going to uh, grow tobacco, we're going to grow rice, right? Or we're going to grow grain because uh, tobacco is, you know, a waste for us. So I think that um, that's, there are long roots uh, to sort of the state-directed uh, development and quest for resources and control over who profits and who participates. I also think that the story is probably a little more complicated than the military side is making out because I certainly spoke to people in the, in the, um, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences who talked about how they were pushing right, the, um, their leaders uh, to be more uh, concerned with resources, right, especially when it comes to Southeast Asian places like the Philippines and cobalt, for example. Please take a, more, uh, take a more positive approach to the Philippines or Vietnam than you're taking because we need those resources because we get a lot of resources from those countries uh, and you're endangering that. So I think that the, a lot of different interest groups playing into this at this point. Sergio Galvez. Uh, this goes a little bit to one of Richard's questions about effects within China and within Chinese uh, uh, dynamics. A stereotypical view of uh, state-owned enterprises uh, is that somebody is sitting there deciding who pursues what opportunities. And that stereotype might be right, might not be right, may have been right at some point, may not be right today. Uh, but there is anecdotal evidence that there's actually an enormous game going on internally on the pursuit of opportunities and competition uh, for the opportunity to pursue opportunities. Can you, uh, can you let us know sort of, were you able to get into that some and what did you find? You want to talk about so I mean, there, I, I'm, not, I'm not recalling a specific instance right here, but there are cases where multiple Chinese companies bid against each other right. for overseas resources. That, doesn't sound like a purely state-directed initiative. I mean, the reality is these guys are running bi big businesses, and a lot of this is commercially driven. Again, the, the state creates a framework with, within which being commercially successful and commercially driven is going to also, in a lot of cases, deliver on national goals. Uh, but that's different from uh, this being all orchestrated from the top. Uh, so I think you see that competition. I'm sure you also see competition politically, again, uh, my guess is that the heads of various soil companies would all love to be the energy minister. Uh, only one of them can be, uh, and it might be someone else. So there's competition to, be, to have a successful company, to be able to invest, but also political competition. Okay, we've got uh, time for a, uh, yes, sure, I'm gonna make, make that the last one. I apologize to the several of you we weren't able to get to. We'll blame it on the authors for the length of their answers. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Dick Huber from uh, Invina Wine Group. Uh, we export a lot of, of agricultural products to China. I mean, uh, wine and, and blueberries and such things from Chile and soybeans from Brazil. And we've always expected to see greater investment in agriculture in abroad. And we haven't seen it. Uh, they. We, we, we love them dearly, they buy, they tend to pay on time and all those good things, but we, and we'd love to sell them a couple of vineyards, I mean. <laughs> but there has been very, very little investment in agricultural production, and certainly in the three countries that I'm involved with, which are Brazil, Argentina, and Chile. Do you see, is that a barrier, or is that something just that will come later? How do you see that? Um, Thank you. So I I would guess that the wine is coming. And in fact, in, in the Chinese media, there was an article just um, maybe a week ago talking about the growing interest uh, of uh, Chinese uh, agricultural sector uh, in, the US, in the United States in particular. Um, but when I, I did some work in Brazil for the, for the book. And, and um, when I was there, uh, again, thinking back to the you know, $70 billion of planned investment, um, 
you know, what I, what I heard, you know, from Brazilian officials was, uh, you know, the Chinese delegations would come, you know, one after another to talk about investment. But what would happen? Uh, a couple of things. First, uh, the Chinese expected uh, that the Brazilian officials could simply, you know, sign a piece of paper and transfer the land to them. <laughs> and the Brazilians said, that's not how our land, you know, system works here. That may be what happens in China, right? Uh, officials and, and uh, you know, p business people can collude and expropriate land, but that's not how we do it here. Um, so that was one problem. The second one was they said a lot of the Chinese delegations really didn't seem that serious about investing, uh, that Brazil is a nice place to visit. All of these, uh, you know, officials and local governments have uh, money for foreign trade delegations, and so they'd simply come over, you know, spend a day doing business, and then head off to Rio uh, and have a good time. Uh, so they felt that there wasn't a lot of seriousness. But I do think, from talking to the Chinese side, that part of the problem in Brazil in particular is a lack of infrastructure as well. Um, and so there's, you know, and the Chinese have tried to get, the, I mean, the Brazilians have tried to get the Chinese interested in that part of it and have not been uh, as successful. Um, and finally, I'll say, the Brazilians themselves were quite worried uh, about a potential flood of, of Chinese uh, investment uh, into the agricultural sector in buying uh, Brazilian land. And so in 2010, they revised their laws, um, bringing parts of an old law back uh, that made it much more difficult uh, to own land. Um, you could only do the minority stake in a joint venture. So that, in that particular case, that was a big part of the problem as well. I was to say two things. Uh, this book uh, on the back flap, it says, this is a council on foreign relations book. And it's one of the things we do because books are an important part of our of our culture and what are, and our mission here, and we encourage our, our fellows. Indeed, we uh, expect our fellows <laughs> to essentially uh, make books. It's not the entire part of their portfolio, but it's a central part. Because in the process of writing a book, you've got to do a depth and breadth of research that informs uh, the rest of uh, the rest of your work. Uh, this is uh, but the uh, the latest of a of a book oriented culture that we uh, that we uh, again encourage. And uh, require here, and it's uh, it's part of our larger commitment to doing serious policy relevant uh, scholarship, and that's just what this is. This is policy relevant scholarship because it deals with this uh, important aspect now of, of China's uh, emergence on the on the world stage, and it has consequences for China and all the places they are emerging uh, into. You have an opportunity uh, to buy the book. As you leave, you will then have an opportunity thereafter to read, to read the book. But again, the, the sequence <laughs> is important. Uh, and uh, at any point in that sequence, you also have uh, the opportunity to uh, have some more to eat, to have something to drink, to privately ask uh, Liz and Michael uh, some questions, but uh, most immediately to congratulate them on the book they have just published. Thanks, Richard.